having now, and we are very aware uh, that we are in a very difficult moment for civil society in many dimensions, in, in many countries, both within the EU and outside the EU. Um, uh, and that's why uh, we in our uh, group, in the uh, Green IFA group, uh, have uh, initiated a campaign uh, which aims at discussing this, making it visible, but also discussing of how can we, as European Union, Commission, Parliament, Member States, can create safe space and create European space for civil society. And this is something that is also um, a driving point for me uh, and, and my work and the work of our team of the, of the campaign. Um, today's debates are um, very manifold and uh, now the civic space is the big buzzword uh, that everyone has been using. Uh, but the centerpiece of our campaign is an initi initiative uh, also to work on this legislatively and to place this topic not just as a topic of um, um, some soft law, but to look for ways of how can we create legislative framework on the European uh, level, which is not easy, but it is worth it. Um, and this legislative work uh, should aim at two goals and two purposes. Um, number one, create a space for NGOs, for associations, for foundations that are non-profits who um, support uh, also financially this, this uh, civil life uh, in the European Union, how to create this space which would transcend <coughs> national borders of member states. And how can we, by doing so, also create a, 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 a qualitative um, tra transition and transformation of civil society, where it will be absolutely natural for civil society not to work and to feel only German or Polish or Spanish, but to actually realize that we're all Europeans, that our causes are European, uh, with all different differences in, in uh, various differences in, in, in various countries, but, but that we are one. Um, and for that, we need a legislative support. And number two, and this is the, the, uh, another important point, is of course, in times of pressure, um, of um, uh, uh, persecution uh, of some NGOs, of uh, criminalization of some NGOs who are not to the liking of some governments, uh, in times where this parliament, uh, instead of looking at uh, what we have done wrong as members of parliament, are starting to look at NGOs and point to them with their fingers and saying that they are not transparent enough, instead of looking how we can we make this parliament more transparent and more accountable. In these times, we should address the issue of protection, this space for NGOs. And uh, also to put it on the legislative level, and I'm looking forward to our discussion because this is not an easy exercise, but this is an absolutely necessary exercise. And we can, of course, refer to the limitations of uh, treaties. We can refer to the limitations of legal basis. But I think we all agree that we need to try to do our utmost possible to have legislative support that will not only enable, but also protect civil space. And this is the causes, these are the causes that we are um, working here. The Commission will announce the proposal of um, certain aspects of this legislation by June. This is what they promised. This is based on the report that this Parliament um, adopted with a broad majority, the report that I wrote uh, in the jury committee and which was supported by the whole Parliament here. Um, and we do hope very much that this will be a first step uh, on this endeavor, on the endeavor where we would like to, uh, um, to go together with you. And I know that many in this room have been supporting this campaign and these plans, and this meeting is yet another uh, um, possibility, a chance for us to exchange where do we stand and where do we want to go. So that was my uh, little uh, spiel to the beginning uh, of the discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, now introduce our guests, uh, which, are, um, which, which also represent the various facets of this coalition, if I may 
count you to uh, the allies and uh, to coalition allies. Um, and uh, I would like to start with one person who is in the middle of it. Uh, um, Marta Schuster um, is from Strike. Uh, Marta, welcome. And uh, I, I, I have an, a, a T-shirt that you gave me, but I, I don't know. Ah, here it is. This is the. You, you, you probably know. I, she was not sure this will fit my size, so I didn't put it on right away. Um, you know, parliamentarian life is uh, has its. Um, um, yeah, it's results that some sizes do not fit anymore. Uh, so, uh, Strai Kobiet is uh, an, an extremely important movement uh, in Poland, and you, Marta, were one of the founding members um, of this, mo uh, this, this movement. A movement that, and I love this formulation, if I can quote, uh, and the YouTube can then censor me, um, it's a movement of pissed-off women and sensible men who support them. That's what they, how they describe themselves. I would say some of these men are also pissed off. Uh, so it's a movement of piss, piss off women and men um, uh, fighting for women's rights in Poland. And Marta is also an interesting case because Marta lives between two member states um, and literally knows about the second layer and second dimension of how to work as a civil society between member states and between countries, and how to improve it if possible. Marta, thank you very much for being here. You will speak in German, we will translate. Um, and uh, please um, tell us how do you see uh, this before we go to the reports and the perspectives from the Commission. The microphone, please. The microphone is not switched on. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll start again. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me here. I am very glad to be here. It is an honor for me and also for all the people who work with me. Um, I've written down a few points because I'm not really used to uh, speak uh, in a parliamentary way. So I am one of the founding members of Strike Object in Poland, and the government uh, has not given us an easy life. Uh, it is not easy to be active, but in the last two years, uh, what has happened uh, is really unbelievable. It's becoming more and more difficult to be active. Two years ago, we had the protest marathon, and we didn't think that the government would have reacted in such a violent way against women who were protesting in a peaceful way. And in many cities, ladies who were protesting were even beaten with sticks, and uh, the 18-year-old daughter of our friend was killed. Um, I personally was also with brutal violence. I was also attacked and was then attacked. And for hours, I was taken to the police station, and they kept me there for hours. So uh, we couldn't really believe that things could have happened in a member state of the European Union. How can this happen in the European Union? Why doesn't anybody protect us? Why aren't we safeguarded? Why isn't anybody doing anything? So it was really a shock and the government, um, you know, we experienced violence on the street, but the government it's also trying to make our life more difficult in our daily activities. So, durch Gerichte gezerrt, wir werden von der Polizei verhört, von der Staatsanwaltschaft. Are consistently taken to the police station and they submit us to interrogations. We are checked, controlled in all our movements. And we do not receive any financial support at all from the government. LGBTQ. You know, we try to safeguard 
women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights. But we do not receive, receive any help whatsoever from our government. Uh, no, we, we do not get, we have no access to European funds. So through the government, we absolutely do not get anything, not even the funds of the European Union. And uh, we know that there are incentives, but unfortunately, uh, these incentives are actually given to those institutions that organize, say, uh, nationalistic uh, marches. And in these marches, the people even destroy the shop windows and everything, but the police doesn't do anything. Whereas if it is women fighting for their own rights, then they use uh, tear gas and they beat us and the police tries to stop us. They are always against demonstrations that aim at safeguarding rights. And when there are other protests where the people with stones destroy everything around them, the police doesn't do anything, but they actually fight against us, women fighting for their own rights. Thank you. Thank you very much for your openness. I know what it means to speak so openly and to report all what you have reported. Thank you very much and thank you very much for your strength. Uh, one of the this was one of the two sort of testimonies from those who are directly affected by the topic uh, that we're discussing today. And now we uh, would like to make a, a little bit of a step back and to look at it from a broader picture, um, uh, at the broader picture from a, uh, a little bit a, a bird eye perspective. And for that, um, we have two experts here, um, uh, Claire McEvoy, uh, a policy analyst yes. uh, uh, from OECD, who is uh, in lead on civic space, and uh, Dennis Devrim, uh, who is also her colleague um, from OECD. We thank you very much for uh, being able to join. Why we um, invited you here uh, is because we heard about a report that you published in December. And as soon as we heard about this report, we said we have to have this, the authors um, uh, um, uh, here. Because this report, as it says, intends to support OECD members and non-members in protecting and promoting civic space by providing overview of its dimensions, current government practices, and uh, there is also a wide range of recommendations and measures um, to safeguard it. Um, and we thought this is precisely what we want to, to do. We want to know what is going on in member states, and we want to know what we should do in order to enable and to protect civil society. <clears throat> we are happy that you were able to join. You have the floor. Please tell us and enlighten us about the results of your study. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a presentation. Uh, we have a PowerPoint coming up shortly. So huge thanks for the invitation uh, to be here today. We're, we're, we've waited a long time for this and we are super happy. Uh, we have some hard copies of the report uh, for you over there on the table. This is actually the highlights version. The report itself is, is much longer, uh, but uh, we'll give you a taste. So please take a look. Uh, this is also available online. Um, so let me just take a brief step back before we get into the report itself to tell you who we are and about the work that we're doing. Um, so we, I work for the, at the Observatory of Civic Space at the OECD, which was set up in 2019. Uh, our role is to advise governments on uh, raising standards and uh, protecting their civic space in very concrete ways. So we support them um, by informing them on which policy areas are most relevant, uh, which institutions are most relevant, and very concretely what steps they could, should be making or taking in order to uh, raise standards. Uh, we do this by collecting data. Uh, obviously, as the OECD, that's what we do best. 
Um, so we collect data from across the membership of the OECD and indeed also from partner countries. We also do country-based work. So we are invited uh, by governments to provide tailored support to them uh, in protecting their civic space. And we've done this. We've worked with six countries already, including uh, Poland, um, sorry, excuse me, including um, Portugal and Romania. Um, we also provide a, f a forum for peer learning and for exchange. So we bring uh, governments and civil society together for dialogue about some of the challenges uh, that civil society is currently facing and that we've just heard about from Marta. Our data, which we will be talking about very, very um, shortly, is a public good. And we invite you to use it uh, in your advocacy and your work on civic space. And we hope that it helps you. So now to the report itself. Um, on the screen there, uh, you can see uh, what we call the, pet, the civic space petals. You can see the areas that we cover in the report. Uh, we basically focus on uh, four key areas, uh, civic freedoms, and underneath that we break it down, obviously, into freedoms of expression, association, assembly, etc. Um, we focus on access to information as a right. Uh, we focus on uh, media freedoms uh, and digital rights, um, online civic space, and then also the enabling environment for civil society. What governments are doing or not doing to support civil society to flourish and operate and, and play its role in democratic societies. Issues around uh, discrimination and inclusion are central in all of our work because we see this as a, a discrimination as a major obstacle to citizens and civil society's ability to engage with governments. So basically, um, what do we mean when we talk about uh, civic space? Protected civic space for us at the OECD, it's about creating the preconditions for people, ordinary people and CSOs to engage in public decision making. In other words, to have a say in policy making and law making uh, on issues that affect their lives. So that's it in a nutshell. <clears throat> the report um, in question, it's based on a survey of the member countries, the 38 member um, governments uh, and other countries that actually opted into the process, recognising its value. So crucially, what this report does, it brings the voice of governments into debates around civic space protection, which have largely been dominated by civil society uh, uh, and research institutes to date. All of the data, uh, I stress this, um, provided by the governments was validated by the OECD Secretariat. And as a complement to the government data that we present in this report, in a series of, of tables and charts, we also, of course, uh, use data from civil society, particularly on areas around implementation. And that, of course, we know that the legal frameworks are there, but it's often in implementation that we find problems. And we have included extensive data from civil society uh, to highlight some of the issues. So the report basically provides comparative data across all the countries and it allows the countries to see what is working, what good practice looks like, what less good practice looks like and where they stand in comparison with other countries. And we provide extensive guidance based on the data, uh, a series of recommendations which I'll come back to later and a series of measures, uh, a wide range of measures that countries could and should uh, continue or consider, consider taking. So the survey itself, we got responses from 52 uh, governments. Uh, you can see we've broken them down for you on the screen. We have 33 OECD members, 19 non-members and 20 EU member states. So when we refer to uh, our findings on the EU uh, shortly, it'll be referring to those 20, not the total number. And as part of this report, we were also uh, extremely happy and privileged to have partnered with a number of uh, CSOs and, and other entities uh, uh, and they gave us data which we published in the report. So we have data in it from RSF, uh, Reporters uh, Without Borders, from the International Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and FRA, which you're all familiar with specifically on challenges in the EU, at the EU level. So just briefly before I hand over to Denise, um, a word about this sort of broad context for this report. 
the situation is evolving and it's very mixed across the membership of the OECD, even within countries and even within administrations within countries with very different um, standards and practices between different ministries in one country. Um, some of the OECD members continuously score very highly on uh, indices uh, to do with civic space dimensions. Others are uh, declining. Uh, others uh, score very quite low uh, in the first place. Um, the, the broad context, as you all know, is, is very, very challenging. Uh, we have the cost of living crisis. We have the climate crisis. We've had COVID-19 and the emergency measures. We have major issues to do with inequality uh, in all of the countries. Uh, we have changing demographics, fears about uh, migration, polarization fed by mis- and disinformation, um, general democratic decline uh, at the global level, and a lack of trust in public institutions and public authorities. Uh, so that is the broad context. Um, we've also found as part of our research that some laws, for example, at national level, they are outdated, they're not fit for purpose, or they're vaguely worded, um, uh, and particularly related to issues around security and counterterrorism. Uh, and that's one issue that we highlight. Data from Civicus, just to give you a snapshot, shows uh, that there has been a decline in some EU member countries. And you can see that on the screen there. Uh, in 2022, civic space was considered open in 56% uh, of EU countries. And that had, that had uh, whereas in 2018, it was 44%. Um, with that broad context and really challenging context in mind, I will now hand over to Denise to tell us more about the data. Thank you, Claire. Um, allow me now to share a small selection of the data uh, with you from our report. And as mentioned by Claire, um, when I mention percentages about EU member states, please keep in mind that we are always referring to the 20 member states that participated um, in this survey. The foundations uh, for the protection of civic space, so namely the legal and institutional frameworks governing freedoms of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly and association uh, are well established in the 52 surveyed countries, though there are exceptions uh, to these rights that are not always in line with international standards. So the infographics that you see uh, on this slide are uh, one example for that. They show who is entitled to these rights. While international human rights uh, instruments do not distinguish between legally recognized citizens and uh, non-citizens when it comes to the entitlement of these uh, civic freedoms and rights, a small percentage of countries does not uh, grant them to all and grant them only to citizens or legal residents, which means uh, concretely that, for example, in some countries, Individuals that are temporarily or irregularly uh, in a country on a territory, such as migrants or foreigners, cannot found CSOs or be members uh, of CSOs. So these infographics uh, show that this, light, uh, this is more limited for the rights, peaceful assembly and association more than freedom of expression. Let freedom of expression. Uh, touched upon and uh, I don't have a lot of time but I do want to say that uh, we find it very worrisome that some of the narratives that legitimize restrictive legislation and also harassment of activists at the national level have been echoed inside the European institutions uh, including the European Parliament and the European Commission um, that uh, have been that are considered as allies by civil society on the ground when their uh, civic space is becoming narrowed or even obstructed. We have seen it, uh, for example, in the midst of the corruption scandal known as Qatargate, which implicates member of the members of the European institutions. Uh, in corruption, money laundering, and organized crime uh, promoted by foreign governments with the aim of uh, uh, influencing their legislative work. This incident has been seized by some to promote 
increase control of CSOs in funding, uh, CSOs funding and activities, but uh, it's important to set their record straight. This is primary, prim primarily an issue of public integrity and corruption involving current and former EU officers. So it seems very convenient to just shift the blame against the civil society as a sector instead of really tackling the need for increased transparency of EU institutions themselves. And uh, we have heard uh, um, that we have an upcoming uh, Defense of Democracy package. In this context, we have a lot of hope, but also really some concerns. We hope this will be really a tool to expand civic space and not to further restrict it under the pretext of defending democracy from outside interference. Um, if we want to address the democratic challenges that we face to today, and uh, shrinking civic space is part of these um, democratic challenges, we also need to understand what are the root causes? And four decades of policy making driven by the agenda of financial capitalism have really increased inequalities and precarity and extended competitions to all aspects of personal life, creating fears and insecurities regarding the future. Many people feel that the democratic processes, both at the national and EU level, as well as the political representatives, do not ensure their needs are addressed or even heard. And when democracy does not deliver on people's needs, concerns and aspirations, trust in democratic institutions tends to perish. This is when regressive forces inside and outside Europe build and gain political capital, really from people's dissatisfaction. Civil society in this context is a very important partner for authorities, again, both at the national and EU level, who want to tackle societal vulnerabilities and environmental concerns and contribute to rebuild trust in democracy. Civil society is on the front lines, mobilizing, responding to social needs, advoca advocating and defending rights and democratic frameworks, even more so during crises, as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, and also um, as a result of, the, of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So what do we need at the European level uh, to uh, support civil society against this democratic backsliding? Well, um, as you know, uh, in June last year, nearly 350 CSOs from all across Europe have called for an overarching European civil society strategy, which could give coherence and strength to the European action in this field. And we just heard some very interesting words from the, the OECD on how important it is to have strategies that, uh, um, at a national level that do this. So today I just want to mention two actions that uh, uh, we hope to see at the European level uh, in the near future. First of all, uh, the EU institutions need to uh, protect civil society and human rights defenders against attacks. And this could be done by either developing EU mechanisms to defend those that are uh, vulnerable to these attacks on the basis of examples that already exist externally, such as the mechanism protect defenders or the new mechanism that uh, uh, is developed by DG IMPA. Or these existing mechanisms could be expanded to support civil society inside the EU. Second, civil society should really be involved in all areas of policy action and all along the policy cycle. This means that beyond consultations, civil dialogue should be recognized and organized on an equal footing to social dialogue in the policy making both at the EU and the national level. 
At the European level, we have uh, Article 11.2 of the Treaty of the European Union, which states that the institutions shall maintain an open, transparent and regular dialogue with representatives of associations and civil society. However, in absence of a structured policy framework and guidelines across EU institutions, uh, we see that the practices and level of engagement really change and vary depending on the sensitivity of civil servants. So civil society is often only consulted through stakeholder consultations after the direction of policies has been decided. And we see this uh, also with the, the Defense of Democracy package. Uh, national civil dialogue on new issues is even weaker. So uh, just uh, to conclude <laughs> what we hope uh, with this Defense of Democracy package, which will include uh, a recommendation on civil engagement, is that uh, uh, this will be an opportunity for your institutions to really give substance to the implementation of Article 11 and will uh, include the clear wording, commitment and guidelines to this. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, from here, I would like to open uh, um, pl a space for discussion. Uh, the question to the technical team or to the team, who is for organizers team, uh, can we uh, stay a little bit longer than half past 12? Okay, because we also started later, so I, I would say 30 minutes we can take for uh, uh, Q&A. And I saw a couple of uh, remarks in the chat. If you could scroll back... Uh, so that we can involve people from online. So I see uh, Alena uh, Kale from uh, the London Story uh, who is asking, we're working on the assault uh, on civic space in India and I'm therefore curious whether the upcoming OECD publication with concrete recommendations will also have application for non-OECD states. Uh, that's an interesting question uh, and a very um, timely one, um, especially now there is a conference uh, going on in India of foreign ministers today. Um, if you could keep it uh, uh, in the storage for your uh, questions. We have um, another question also to uh, EC, uh, so European Commission um, or uh, our OECD partners. Can the Commission or OECD report uh, and work also address ongoing attacks against NGOs in the European Parliament by some MEPs and groups. Well, uh, this is uh, another reminder that this is a very timely <laughs> topic and we already addressed this on multiple occasions. Um, guidelines on an enabling environment for civil society and the collective defense of human rights with recommendations for EU delegations, similar to the um, I, uh, HRD's guidelines. Uh, Folguera Castro uh, is asking uh, if you could address this later. And then we have one more. I think this is the most recent one. A question to Ingrid. How do you see the role and powers of the European Commission in protecting civil space where member state governments are not, uh, are not, where member states governments are not, are not protecting. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so like the examples uh, that Marta shared uh, from Poland, what does the European Commission do concretely to support civil society there? How can this be strengthened? A, a lot of questions to our regulatory and ob observatory uh, uh, friends, but I would like maybe to start with going back to uh, the situation on the ground and ask uh, Marta. Marta, you heard a couple of... Um, um, also proposals and recommendations, what should be done. And yet, your situation is very precarious um, and there were already many recommendations and there is a commission going against uh, and, some, and member states going against Polish government and cutting the funding for... Have a look now at um, laws limiting freedom of expression, expression, existing laws that can restrict freedom of expression. So I would really hope, and we had the first call very successful with 50 million euros, and we will have a next call next year. So that is what we're hoping with a little bit of a creative mm -hmm. thinking. 
have also cut off a little bit of the red tape, which is a huge uh, challenge in EU funding, uh, and uh, lump sum systems and so. So I really hope that an organization like you could could benefit from uh, such a funding if uh, a Polish uh, intermediary or in an, uh, any way we could, we could try to uh, reach the, that level because we know that the member states, some member states are blocking. Just just access. very, very, very brief uh, 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 advertising uh, break. I have in German, uh, I don't know if you have seen it, a booklet that we produced on SURF program mm -hmm. and what are the best ways of um, applying uh, for that program. And I'm very grateful that the red tape was uh, cut because uh, in my being part of NGOs, I had to apply for Citizens for, uh, and C citizens mm -hmm. for Europe. I mm -hmm. think it was the last, the, the, the yeah, name. This was a horror. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that it's been still s simplified. <laughs> it's still horror. Yeah. Um, but uh, you had a couple of other questions addressed to you. Maybe you could um, also uh, react to them. Yeah, and how can we uh, in the Commission at the EU level uh, increase um, protection of the civil space when the member states don't? That is, of course, the delicate balance with subsidiarity. Uh, the EU can only act where we have competence, and it's only when we see a violation or an infringement of EU law that the Commission can intervene uh, through the so-called infringement procedures. We have successfully done that, um, in rule of law area, we have just uh, launched a, a, a case in the court against Hungary for the so-called child protection laws that actually uh, aim at um, banning certain uh, content of uh, LGBTIQ nature. So the Commission is acting, but that is, of course, a very complicated and lengthy procedure. Uh, so we use the tools we have. We try and also to use the, the, the positive way of of uh, supporting member states and, and through funding, but also through uh, sharing best practices and kind of building the capacity to to do better. So I think this is the step-by-step -step approach that I referred to, this toolkit, where we have different aspects. Um, thank you. Uh, and let me uh, go here over to Claire and uh, uh, Denise, I, if, if I may have first name basis, I'm, that's okay. um, uh, a couple of questions to you. And one question that I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned the digital dimension, the digital space, something that is very dear to my heart and also to the heart of the campaign, because one, uh, the campaign that I represent, because one dimension of our campaign is in how far uh, the uh, mass surveillance instrument mm -hmm is also being used to intimidate uh, civil space, to make it more narrow. We're actually negotiating now the artificial intelligence. I, I am doing this I, I act and trying to get the ban of mass surveillance into this act, also knowing that this would have positive implications for civil society and civil space. Um, what, is, what are the, the exact findings that you had there? Because the digital space can also empower, but it also, of course, can... Uh, limit and restrict. So, uh, please, if you could address a couple of points, and then we will open for those who are present here in the room um, for your questions. Great, thank you. Uh, so, there was the question about application for non-OECD, the application of our recommendations for non-OECD countries. Absolutely. Um, the recommendations and measures in the report uh, they're very broad, they're pretty comprehensive, it's a big old report, and they were written deliberately in a way uh, so that they are applicable in uh, contexts with very different standards. So they address those uh, needs. Uh, and also a reminder that 19 countries who are not OECD members opted in to our data gathering process uh, and gave us their data, and we are also speaking to those countries. So um, the application is, is very broad. Um, then on digital, digital civic space, so we didn't gather data on mass surveillance. Uh, we know from data from FRA, uh, it is obviously, it is a concern, I believe 12% uh, in their latest uh, uh, data, 12% of CSOs that answered a FRA survey had concerns about surveillance, mm -hmm. um, which is significant and extremely, extremely concerning and needs to be monitored. Um, our findings on the digital sphere, uh, we focused on um, hate speech, 
hate speech as uh, and hateful speech as an obstacle to people's ability to engage in public debates online, which, as we know, um, targets minorities, targets women, anyone in the public sphere uh, is at risk of this hateful contact. Con- content that has exploded with the use of social media. And it's a partic- it leads to censorship and self-censorship. Uh, and it's something that anyone in the, in the public sphere is really uh, struggling with. Uh, so we focus on that and measures that countries are taking to, to, um, to address that. Uh, and more, much more needs to be done. It's a particularly challenging area. Uh, and the other area that we look at is the explosion of, of misinformation and disinformation. Um, also as a sort of obstacle to people's ability to get factual information. Uh, how can they engage in public debates if they can't get mm-hmm, the facts? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there are major areas of concern about that, and we have uh, included some, some detail in our report on that uh, uh, and some recommendations on how countries can address it. Thank you so much. And with that, we're back in the room. Um, uh, I, I, I heard that there are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, great. Uh, anyone else so that we have an overview? Okay, well, let's start with you. Welcome here, uh, our great allies from the philanthropies. Yes, thank you so much for great presentations and, and uh, conversations here. Um, yeah, so, so indeed, I represent the foundation philanthropy sector, which uh, is considered and we believe a part of civil society. So in that sense, also the call on you to consider us also in discussing solutions, recommendations and, and the barriers that are listed, we experience them at, um, as well. When you look at our role, of course, we are also supporters and funders of other civil society actors. And in that regard, you focus on government funding, public funding, which is the huge chunk of funding. But there are also other supporters out there who are struggling and facing barriers, in particular also when it gets to cross-border funding and foreign funding restrictions, which unfortunately are put in place um, even within the EU context, but also outside. There's a lot of countries who make it very difficult also for philanthropic organizations to engage in other parts of the world where the local laws are restrictive. So if that could also be considered in uh, when you are discussing guidance or, or recommendations at the global level. There is also work done by the UN Special Rapporteur also on, on freedom of association was also looking into, into these elements. So uh, the question also how you are liaising potentially with, with other actors on this to discuss these, um, these questions at the global level. Um, one of the key, I would say, drivers um, behind shrinking civil society and civic space, we sense it's the security agenda. So it is, these are um, money laundering, terrorism financing, um, prevention mechanisms, which are, of course, very important and needed, but governments also use such a policy to close down on civil society space. So this sometimes happens, um, this policy sometimes restricts our sector unintentionally, but sometimes it's really also used by governments as, a secu- uh, as an excuse to close down on the space. So this is something that we consider um, in an EU context, but also in a global context, of course, that there needs to be policy consistency and also a view of those policies um, which are potentially used um, by actors to close down the space or which have unintended consequences of the sector. Um, yeah, and we, we yesterday we, we had a we had a session also at which we were discussing also the enabling space for civil uh, society in the context of the civil society days which are happening right now, and that's where we also were discussing the different building blocks uh, that potentially could lead to a holistic European civil society strategy or simply a framing to ensure that there are very important works which are currently undertaken are somehow bridged and connected well to one another so that they are moving towards, I would say, a vision, a, a vision for, for European civil society. So in that spirit, also reflecting on the fact that five years ago, we were, um, or many of the actors were only starting looking at this, this issue. And now we already moved really far. We see that many of the policymakers are concerned, are taking um, the concerns very seriously. So this gives us hope also that there is move into the future in, in moving this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, almost five years ago were the European elections, and with the new parliament, you, I think you had a, a lot of allies, and, and I'm not done mean myself, uh, but uh, Anna Donat and many others, we, you know, we have also a, a, a coalition of forces within the parliament for whom this is a major important point. Uh, and um, taking those questions, I don't see uh, anyone. Ah, yeah, I do see. Then I will hold my uh, question back. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Klaatvlieg, working for the European Endowment for Democracy. Um, I had a question specifically about uh, defamation laws in this section that you talked about the, the criminalization of, of defamation. And I was wondering if there is a current trend to decriminalize uh, defamation. Uh, we're currently working with uh, partners in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina where they're actually moving to criminalize uh, defamation uh, using basically an EU bad practice uh, as their now candidate uh, country to, to copy that into their own, uh, into their own system. Um, and, and people are looking actually for arguments for decriminalization and to keep it uh, in, in a civic space. So I was wondering if you can provide some context for this. That's an important question that uh, actually dear to my heart as being, a, being a, a lawyer myself and constitutional lawyer. I think we are overdoing it a little bit with uh, defamation laws and wanting to protect everyone against bad speech. You know, in the democracy, you have some time probably to endure certain things. Otherwise, it can be abused. Um, so... But the question was not to me, it, the question, this question is probably to you. Uh, but also, I would say to Marta and Jada, whether you see this the same way. I mean, you are probably also targets of defamation. So it's, um, you know, do you want to decriminalize uh, defamation uh, to make uh, more space for free speech? Or do you, would you rather have more protection against uh, attacks? So uh, this balance, I think your perspective um, uh, would be important uh, in this, on this question as well. But uh, first uh, to you. Yes, maybe I'll start with the question on defamation. So in our research, we have not seen a trend really towards uh, decriminalizing or criminalizing. You have uh, individual countries here and there that do either or. So, um, I mean, even at EU level, I believe only three member states have totally decriminalized defamation. So there is no trend for sure on this and um, some countries have defamation laws but don't foresee prison sentences. This already would be a step um, not to foresee prison sentences but also uh, this, uh, for sure there is no trend. Uh, sometimes it comes up again here and there. I think in Armenia there were discussions recently again in Latin America, um, but uh, the, the situation is that most countries criminalize and this is yeah. the situation right now. I just wanted to add one point on digital. We have looked uh, at strategies on artificial intelligence and we had a, a list of criteria in how far these national strategies actually realize that it can have an impact on civic freedoms and rights. Mm -hmm going beyond data protection and um, mm -hmm. discrimination, because this is kind of established that algorithms have an impact, they can discriminate, they can replicate uh, biases, uh, biases yeah. um, but that it can also have an impact on assembly. And But uh, so it is, uh, some countries uh, only mention it, others uh, engage in their strategies. Now I'm only talking about strategies. Some uh, engage in a deeper discussion mm -hmm. so it's kind of starting that countries become aware so this is one element that we um, also looked into on uh, yeah points taken on philanthropy we have uh, tried to gather data on private funding it was again a very difficult area it's very difficult to uh, find the information the data that we received from governments was really bad. I mean, we didn't really receive a lot of information, which doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just, I think one of the main challenges that governments have, we already discussed it, it's a cross-cutting issue. So it's a challenge for governments to coordinate also internally 
uh, an institution such as the OECD would have one focal point, which would then need to coordinate cross-sector wise. So often the reason why we don't have data on funding or philanthropy. But in addition, we have another section on philanthropy where we did look, um, I don't know if you want to take that one, Claire, on uh, where philanthropic money goes to uh, regarding different regions globally. So we do have uh, some data, which is not from our um, directorate, but uh, from the OECD uh, that works on this topic. Thank you. Let's let's go before we we, we come back um, uh, to to the commission, and we'll have to uh, um, finish. Uh, let's go to you, Marta, and to Jada for your final observations, and also addressing this issue. You know, where do we have this balance, and how do we strike the balance between protection through um, uh, state yeah, against defamation, for example, and attacks? on the one hand, and on the other hand, having slaps and having this um, abuse of these laws against uh, um, NGOs. What, what would you say? Is the balance, uh, for example, in Poland now the right one, or should we go in one or the other direction? Also, I can so much to say that well, I would say that the Polish government uh, is actually uh, activating the ministry focuses specifically on people, uh, millions of them. We have a region, we have an area. Uh, where there are websites that are nationalistic and they shoot against us all the time and they have so much money, they can really attack us in a target-oriented way. And there are even people uh, who come and film us, they, they uh, shoot uh, what we are actually doing, uh, doing our protests. So we are really followed and there is a tactical activity carried out by the Polish government. Uh, they know where they should give the money so that these people that are extremists uh, can have the power uh, to fight against us and to destroy us. I have to say that. The Polish government is not even hiding the fact that they're acting against us. Recently, our Minister Tarnik, the Education and University Minister, uh, said that uh, whoever's got connections with the communists cannot have any funds. And it is an open fact that the government works against us and against NGOs. Thank you very much. Uh, to our discussion here, um, how do we deal with slaps, with this abuse also of defamation against uh, um, um, organizations, but also what do you expect uh, in terms of the strategy uh, that you don't, because I'm, I would like to repeat this question. We have the addressees here, what do you expect in terms of strategy? What kind of building blocks do you want to see there? Thank you. Um, yes, on slaps, uh, to be honest, I don't think I am the uh, best placed person to um, uh, explain how to uh, find this very delicate uh, balance. Um, I think that the uh, uh, mechanisms to um, uh, shut down uh, malicious lawsuits uh, when uh, it's clear that it's slap, uh, that we are talking about slaps uh, are very important because uh, uh, these uh, prevent them from uh, draw, dragging uh, uh, activists through uh, really lengthy procedures. 
uh, that uh, don't even aim at winning the case, but just uh, basically wasting uh, um, their money, time um, uh, into uh, protection against uh, these uh, uh, lawsuits. In terms of uh, a strategy, um, I think that uh, uh, what the civil society wants uh, is really to have coherence, uh, um, first of all, among actions. Uh, we heard it before, sometimes uh, um, legislation, including EU legislation, can have unintended consequences to shrink civic space. So it's really important to have um, this uh, um, framework to, to make sure that the institutions always have uh, in mind when they legislate to involve civil society and also to make sure that uh, laws don't uh, unduly uh, restrict the civic space. Um, it's really important to have uh, legal standards. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, of course, we hope that uh, the uh, European Statute for Associations uh, could be um, a positive step in this direction to really have uh, um, European standards that protect, protect uh, um, not only uh, civil society as uh, a social actor, but also a political watchdog. Um, then, of course, there is funding. We have heard about the serve, which is a really, really important tool and uh, has uh, some important innovations. There are also important challenges that need to be overcome. And uh, some of these innovation could also be spread to other EU funding, because let's not forget that uh, civil society is not only supported by the CERV, but also other programs uh, who have issues. Civil dialogue is another key pillar, and I've already talked about it. And then, of course, protection. Um, I, I will be happy to uh, work with the... Um, the colleagues in the Commission to unpack all of these uh, uh, pillars um, further. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, next time live uh, uh, here. Um, it's uh, it happens. Uh, it so happens that the final word has our guest from the Commission, <laughs> and I think this is also symbolic, and this is also right because. Without you, without your initiatives, we will not be able to move in the legislative realm and in many other issues. And uh, we also have one question from this round, the final question, which is also addressed to the Commission. And so it's fitting. Uh, please, you have the floor, and then Ingrid will have the final word in this discussion. It doesn't work. Does it work now? Perfect. Thank you for accommodating the question. I appreciate it. Um, this is Judith Lantai from the Young European Federalists, Jeff Europe. Um, and basically, I just wanted to bring up one point that came out from the OECD report as well. And I, I wanted to um, acknowledge that, that there was also a figure about participation and how certain citizens or certain people get less access also to participate in civic space. So um, the question is also about how can we address some of these vulnerabilities that also inevitably um, stream into civic space. And the question comes, how can we address it institutionally, actually? So whether you're a young person, uh, whether you're a woman, uh, whether you're coming from a racialized group, how do we, how do we tackle that together? Sure. Thank you very much for giving me such importance. <laughs> Maybe allow me to just a, a personal reflection because I, I worked now in the Commission for about 20 years. I've always worked in areas of, of rights-based, victims' rights, gender equality, uh, or, um, fundamental rights, and I, I would not be able to do my work without CSOs. That's absolutely sure. That it, no policy would be able to be developed without the input of, of civil society actors. That's that's a given for me. But I, I think that this is the time, and I, I really appreciate the, the, the positive spin that we actually moved a long way after, since five years. 
it seems like a no-brainer that we need to discuss this because it's such an important part of, of our democracies and, and the work that we are trying to do together. But I do believe that this is the time that we should put this in a, in a more structured way, in a more strategic way. And I want to reassure you that what we're doing now in many, as I said, this toolbox, we're doing many parts, these building blocks are being uh, put in place. Um, I think I'm not going to preempt any political decisions about that, but I, I certainly see that the Commission has put this at, as a very top priority in, in across many po policies. It's not only on fundamental rights and values, but I think that the cradle of the, the, the topic should be here firmly on, on, on the fundamental rights and rule of law and democracy where we, we are working on this area. And uh, giving the voice to civil society actors are absolutely crucial and to the citizens themselves. And I think through the union of equality strategies that we have presented in the last few years, the accessibility and the uh, taking into account vulnerabilities and marginalized groups are uh, key principles. So everything we do, we have to ensure that that is done. So I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what that will be, but that's certainly something that we are seriously looking at when we are developing further the, the measures that are coming up. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. Of course. Well, thanks, thanks so much. And thanks for your support. I, I think that uh, I, I, from my perspective must say that um, we do feel support of the commission and openness of the commission vis-a-vis -vis our initiatives and I think you know it has to be underlined as well we're still looking forward to see what you will be present in your package uh, in uh, May, May. Yeah. Uh, and we are still looking forward to see what DG Grow will present uh, in the package regarding the cross-border associations this is uh, very important that we continue to apply pressure, uh, despite our compliments uh, for the Commission. I think, uh, you know, everyone needs some pressure. Uh, so let's continue um, with this campaign. Join our campaign on defending civil society. Uh, you can get more information about this uh, on the Greens IFA page. If you want uh, specific information uh, on the upcoming Commission initiatives to get them via email, please leave. We have lists here. Um, uh, leave your email and your name uh, in a readable way uh, uh, that we can use it for our uh, um, uh, distribution list. Uh, thank you to the team who has been working tirelessly on this uh, um, uh, with Stella Gebauer, who is uh, here present from my team, and Nina Walsh, who was here until five minutes ago, uh, from uh, the group and uh, both teams, mine and the group's team. And now we come uh, to the snacks that are waiting outside. Uh, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. This is just one of many meetings that we need to move forward this agenda. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you finally. Yeah. <laughs> so the paths are...